Welcome to the Look It's Rock and Roll podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Today, it's just Mark and myself. And we're going to... How are you doing? We're just going to have a light conversation. Uh, you know, we often plan out episodes to talk about full albums, dive in with a bunch of folk uh, on topics and go in depth and do lots of preparation. And today, we don't want to do that because last week when we were recording the Kiss FAQ podcast, we had a little discussion in the middle of that about a band and an album that really seemed worthy of a little bit of discussion just on its own and obviously that show is not the right forum to be discussing rush and mark's favorite album presto <laughs> i i was absolutely flabbergasted mark when you actually bashed this album um put it as i think you uh, called it your least favorite an album that let you down no end and that there were even its two immediate predecessors, you liked more than that. Now, for me as a Rush fan, this was where they really started coming back into form for me after a period of extended uh, synth-heavy, you know, kind of light pop, you know, hair in a ponytail, um, <laughs> Miami Vice outfit era. So mm -hmm. I was very happy with this album. And to this day... Um, both of the Hine produced albums, particularly Roll the Bones, is one of my all-time favorite Rush albums. So that is what made my jaw drop last week. So what was your first impression of Presto back in, what, 1989 when it came out that made you hate it so much or dislike it so uh, vehemently? <clears throat> well, okay. i got to set it up like this. I am a lifelong Rush fan. Love the band. To me, they are here and everything else is under Rush. Just because it was my first band that I really got into and they just really made a huge impact on me. Now, I really got into their catalog in great detail. I loved moving pictures. I loved all the older records, Hemispheres, 2112 and all that. And I was really into it. And by the time albums like Move Power Windows came around or even Grace Under Pressure before that, you know, I was noticing that there was a little bit of a difference in sound. You know, Grace Under Pressure was still a record I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, and I went, that was my first concert tour. Uh, they came in 1984 in September, I believe it was, at Maple Leaf Gardens. That was my first concert. I was like 11 years old when that happened. My sister took me and it made a huge impact on me. Um, from that point on, like starting from Power Windows, uh, Power Windows was a huge left turn from Grace Under Pressure. There was all kinds of keyboards. Uh, the bass guitar sound radically changed. He was using a wall bass instead of using his Fender, you know, jazz basses and all those other kind of guitars at the time. And, you know, he was he starting to use those little box Steinberger basses too at the time. And, you know, the sounds were changing. Alex's guitar was getting less and less distorted, more jangly and kind of semi-distorted. And I was kind of going, you know, well, what's going on here? Because, you know, you got to remember when somebody's like, you know, gung ho into 2112 and, you know, Farewell to Kings and Hemispheres, those are like very guitar heavy, like heavy sounding in comparison to those records, right? So, and here's the thing that really bothered me, because I'm getting to your, your question right now, is Q107, the big radio station here, every time they premiered a Rush record, they always prefaced it with the same saying management has sent us a letter saying that this record is going to be the heaviest thing since moving pictures that was the big catch line all the time that they tried to pull rush fans in when they did the album premiere they did the album premiere for power windows it sounded nothing like moving pictures a couple of years later they did hold your fire they did the same thing this is the heaviest thing it's going to be like like moving pictures didn't sound nothing like it. I came to find out years later that Rush even scratched their head as to why their promotional company sent such a completely insane letter like that because they even said it sounded nothing like it. They even knew it didn't sound anything like that. They were at a different phase. Rush are a truly progressive band in that sense. They never stay in one area for too long, right? So now here comes Presto. 
And this time they were like, the, the DJs were pounding their hands down saying, this time, this album is going to be the closest thing to moving pictures, you know, in a very long time. So I'm like, okay, great. So they debut Show Don't Tell as the first single. So at first I was kind of like, okay, what's going on here? You know, do, 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 that little drum thing starts at the beginning. And then it comes at, it comes in. I'm like, oh, okay, this is, this is promising. And the first listen to it, I was like, okay, I, I, I don't mind this song, you know, because, you know, sure, it didn't have the same kind of like Marshall driven guitar sound. He was still kind of using those Gailey and Kruger amps still, you know, with the, with the pre RS guitars or the, I think he was still actually using those signature guitars, those, uh, Canadian made guitars that he was using. Uh, but anyways, you know, the tones were getting better on that single. So I was ready to go to the store, buy the record. I went to the record store, grabbed it, put it in my car because I, I had a cassette player and they had it on cassette and CD at that time. There was no vinyl to be seen at that time. Uh, slapped it in the car. First song comes on, show, don't tell. Yeah, yeah okay, great. I love this song. Next song, Chain Lightning. Ooh, what's this? Ugh. Then The Past comes on. I'm like, mm, it's, it's okay. Okay, this is the ballad of the album. I'll, I'll let that slide. Then it just continued, you know, like, just... It was really a letdown for me because as the album continued, there was no progression in it getting any kind of, you know, there's no power to the guitars. The bass was very much like this. Da -da 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 -da. It was very mid-rangey, the bass. There was hardly any bottom. I really didn't like Neil Peart's drum sound, and this was terrible. He had changed, I believe, to Ludwig drums from Tama at this point, and I just couldn't stand the drum set sound at this point. And mainly, the, the, the songs I just thought were not memorable. Like, even now, when I try to think back to Presto, the only songs I can think in my head melodically are Show Don't Tell, The Pass, uh, Presto, the title track, and... Uh, superconductor as kind of I can remember and maybe a little bit of red tie just that piano beginning -na 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 -na. that's the one thing that I remember but the rest of it honestly it I don't find it memorable and to be quite honest they ended on such a terrible note for me like available light sounds like something that Frank Sinatra could have covered and I just really couldn't stand that song so and then on a sour note in that whole record I just shook my head and was seriously pondering about jumping off. Yeah, but no one ever gets to really jump off from the bands that they love, do they? You always give yeah. them another chance. It's it's always one of those things that we do, no matter how much of a tangent yeah. they go off on. And thank goodness Rush isn't a band like ACDC, which shows very little progression between albums. I mean, they had their, their most progression on the very first album when they had a love song on it, and that was the last time ever seen. Uh, something <laughs> that wasn't like out of the standard canon no pun intended, uh, of ACDC <laughs> sounds. But Show Don't Tell, for me, I mean, right from that beginning, and it's very percussive, it's like a, a Kalahari woodblock percussive mm -hmm. copy of Men at Works, you know, a whistle intro. Um, you know, it's like a psych out. It's like you start listening to it, you're like, oh crap, it's more of the same. It's more of the heavy, synthy, um, percussive features that had been a, a real centerpiece of particularly hold your fire but more so i, I guess in some ways uh, power windows both of which mm. uh, for me while they do have some good songs on each are ones that i have the same problem as you with this one of picking out obvious melodies for the vast majority mm. of the tracks other than those ones which i i do particularly like which we're talking 30 percent um if that, wow. and, it, and it's primarily the singles, but Show Don't Tell itself is probably the very best songs on the album for me. Uh, it's just, it hits you like a ton of bricks, all of this, when it kicks in um, mm. to the riff, you've got the drums yeah. and you've got, you know, they're, they're good sounding drums to me, though they are different than the sound of drums that you're talking about. So I, I understand what you're, the criticism that you're levying yeah. at them without a, a part. But one thing that strikes me immediately, and it's a theme that continues throughout every single song, is the reliance on acoustic guitar. Mm. To, it, it almost sounds like a nylon string in some ways. Um, just 
that that's used to underlie everything musicality including electric guitars is, are doubled with that acoustic that changes the dynamic and the texture on everything but then it's the same all the way through a bit also like you you said with getty's bass which is you know a, a great thing you use keys to uh sustain parts of a song and to mm -hmm. elevate areas and develop atmosphere you do the same with acoustic guitars and on this mm -hmm. album they're doing acoustic guitars and piano you know it, it's like mm -hmm. your your favorite producer gone mad in terms of doubling um <laughs> which which is a very i guess rock and roll thing but i think probably the best part of the song is the solo which is a bass solo so yeah uh, but then then you move on. I mean, you want to respond to any of, of, of kind of my my thoughts there? Well, I mean, I think it's very uh, interesting and important that you brought up the acoustic guitar because you're absolutely right. The acoustic guitar plays a very huge part of this record. I mean, I wonder how many uh, guitar players who are into Rush realize how much acoustic guitar underpins this whole record. I mean, if you were to get the master tracks and just put all the faders up, you would be surprised probably how much acoustic guitar is just playing along to, to almost every part in this song. I mean, the verse parts in Show, Don't Tell, uh, even the chorus parts. I mean, Presto itself is a, based solely around the acoustic guitar. Then you listen to songs like The Pass. I mean, there's a guitar, there's electric guitar and acoustic guitar in complement throughout that whole bit. Anytime you hear him playing something that's even semi-clean on electric, there's an acoustic guitar under there. And, I'm not, and another thing that he loved doing at this time was something called Nashville tuning, which basically is when you take a 12 string acoustic guitar and you take all the low strings off of it and just leave all the high tuned strings on there, it gives you a really, really jangly kind of sound. The best example of that is the beginning of Hey You from Pink Floyd, the wall that, -ne 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 -ne, that little piece that he plays, that's Nashville tuning guitar. And it has that really bright and really plucky kind of sound to it. And it stands out in the mix like crazy. So he used to love doing that by putting that in any kind of part where he had some sort of arpeggiated line. He would put a Nashville tuned guitar underneath it to kind of really make that part stand out. I mean, during this period, like anywhere between power windows to this time, his clean sound is probably the one thing that guitar players really took to. Like I know John Petrucci said that he based his whole electric clean sound around this era of Rush's guitar sound because he was he loved it so much and I can see that because it's very clear you can put keyboards bass drums and it'll still come through in the mix because of the way he structured it so I think it's very very interesting that you brought that point up I think lyrically the album also is very strong still with a, a lot of the stuff that Neil's doing I mean talking about the moon and tides I mean it, it he's the intellectual songwriter in so many ways but chain lightning you you start off again it's like a sucker punch it starts off you're like okay so that that first song was an anomaly this one's starting off all light and fluffy and then boom it kicks in as well so it's like yeah. a monty python joke it's like haha we tricked you twice uh you know rush humor i guess um yeah but the melody of that song you know, it's a very comfortable kind of rock, but not too hard rock sound that permeates mm -hmm. it. I just love, though, the pre-chorus, you know, respond, vibrate, feedback, yeah. resonate. I mean, that's just, for me, it's a, just a great, it's stupid, but um, for me to like it as much as I do. But it's just one of those, like, little phrases that I think uh, really resonates with me. Nope. Uh. Pun intended <laughs> again, um, but the the pass. I mean, is exquisite. You know, I, I was like thinking about all these songs and like, well, it's exquisite. But any other words would be unnecessary because it's just like a really wonderful piece of music. But it's really not that memorable. Um, hmm. And I believe it was a single as well from yeah. the album. So it's, it's probably why War Paint. I'm just like now I start getting where you're coming from with your kind of opening monologue about the album of it kind of being a little bit one note across and it's just mm. like more of the same elements it was at this point listening back to the album that i'm like okay there are those guitars again oh wait getty's bass again you know it, mm. it's still not a lot of dynamic shift between the songs it's like we've got our amp set we've got our instruments dialed in and tuned we're going to use them for every song 
um, but we'll add a little bit of percussive seasoning differently for each one and go through it. Now, for most of the songs, that doesn't matter. You know, the uh, title track, I think, is possibly mm. the strongest song of the album for myself, and it really mm. sums up the high era perfectly of what he was kind of bringing into the sound, into the production, mm -hmm. and also what he was having the band do in terms of seizing. What do you know about him as a producer, and, and what were your thoughts about him being picked for the task? Um, back when they announced Rupert Hine was going to be on there doing it, I had no clue who Rupert Hine was. I was very much of the, you know, Terry Brown. And then when Peter Collins came in and did the other records for uh, Power Windows and those things, I was like, okay, you know, he, he kind of, he kind of didn't sit too well with me at first because at first I didn't like those two records. I really didn't like Power Windows and Hold Your Fire. Hold Your Fire. It was only years later like when I, you know, got into my 30s or whatever, where I started going, wow, this is like, the, I now am connecting with this record and understanding it, but that's for another discussion. But Rupert Hine, when he came in, I liked the fact that he was a kind of singer-songwriters sort of producer. He's very much all about the song. He's very much about the arrangement. And that's one of the things that I think that he kind of did you know, and I have to be honest, because as much as I don't like this record, I know he did kind of tighten up their song structures. He didn't let them go off too far on any kind of, kind of tangents where they put in like, you know, four bars or something completely unnecessary to most producers ears. You know, he kind of kind of cut these things out and made it more. I don't know if commercial is the right word, but maybe he did try to lead them down that more commerciality path to make it more, you know, radio friendly. You know, don't forget Rush was now, um, I'll put it this way. When I saw them in 84, Maple Leaf Gardens was packed. When I saw them in 88 on Hold Your Fire, I was able to get like gold level tickets, which is down at the bottom very easily. But, you know, the day of the show, it was 75% full. So basically, I think they kind of realized that they were maybe losing people at this point of their fan base. And maybe Rupert Hine was brought in to kind of, you know, let's bring in some new people, some fresh audience people, maybe people who listen to radio more, and let's make your songs more radio friendly a bit more. Now, I think that Rupert Hine is directly the reason why I don't like these two records. I'm talking Presto and Roll the Bones. Now, Roll the Bones, I like the album. Don't get me wrong. I think it's... You're stabbing me in the heart here. No, no, no. Hang on. Let me finish. Uh, Roll the Bones is heads and tails better than Presto. I, there's no doubt about it. But Presto, but th but these two records, again, proved my ear earlier theory, because I had this little thing in my little channel that I did before where I was doing this com com uh, comparison of Rush records, where there's always a attempt and then a success. Rush, Fly By Night was a success. Crest of Steel, they tried something good. And then it, it was a, it wasn't a failure, but in 2012 was the better of it. Farewell to Kings was a, an idea. They tried to be very British prog, and then it didn't do as well in my eye. And then Hemispheres was the realization of that idea. Same thing, per Permanent Ways was an idea that they came up with. You know, let's try to go a little bit more keyboardy, a little bit more like this, shorter songs. You know, it's a good album, but Moving Pictures was the 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 vision come to life there. And I, and I see that through their whole catalog. It's like that to me. Signals was the attempt. Grace Under Pressure, the success. Power of Windows was the attempt. Hold Your Fire. And just like here, Presta was their attempt at maybe going a little bit more radio, back to guitars, a little less keyboards. And I think Roll the Bones was the, the realization of that idea. Now, don't get me wrong. Roll the Bones is good, but Real, Roll the Bones is also the album that made Rush themselves realize that they had to get rid of Rupert Hine. Because when they played those songs live, they were so much heavier. They were so much more in your face. Like, listen to Dreamline on the album and listen to it on d different stages. It, what a difference in attack, in sound. And that's when Alex Lyson also realized that I got to get rid of these Galleon Kruger amps and go back to Marshall's, you know, and start using real hard rock equipment again. Getty had to get rid of that stupid wall bass and bring back the, you know, the, the jazz bass. That's why, that's why I'm saying, like, Rupert Hine, I understand why he was brought in and what his what he was supposed to do with them. And I think he succeeded. I mean, 
Roll the Bones, the song was a pretty popular song. In fact, if my memory serves me correctly, Roll the Bones was probably one of the highest selling records they had for a long time. I think it went platinum in the United States, that record, if not more. And it, and it was like high on the, 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 on the charts from what I remember as well. And the tour did really good. So yeah, it did well in that aspect. But sonically, I still think Rupert Hine just didn't connect sonically. If that album, if you would have made it a little bit heavier, I think Roll the Bones could have been like a like top three record for me. Okay, I'm I'm relieved. Thank you for explaining that because I was getting very nervous with Roll the Bones where you were going initially on that. Um, but yeah, I I totally agree that Roll the Bones is like the success of the full development of the ideas that start with Presto. Um, and again, I love it. I think Ghost of a Chance is one of the all time mm -hmm. very best Rush songs. Period. Yes. Um, lo love it to pieces, and also love the what you said about different stages and you know some of the other live albums where material has cropped up it is far better in a live environment it is, and the same goes for the material off presto that's been mm -hmm. performed live it too takes on more of the character of obviously a band performing live but a, a band of exquisite musicians in a power trio format well is it fair to call them a power trio with, with getty's feet um <laughs> you know at the, at the same time and neil obviously is like six people back there he's like an octopus so mm -hmm. you know it, it very much makes sense going back to presto and some of the songs on there superconductor red barchetta part two i've always called that it's always been just one you know it's head starts nodding it i'm you know it, it's a winner again i think it was one of the singles but you know the rest of it is really a bit well uh, again single note which is uh, problematic but those singles are just very strong versus for me the songs on um hold your fire is i was listening to that i to set this album up I had mm -hmm. to listen to the predecessor. I've stayed away from a show of hands, obviously being the live album um, that was released in between these two things, but I just can never get into Hold Your Fire. Other than the first two tracks, Force 10, mm -hmm. again, incredible. And Time Stand Still with, uh, who was the guest? Uh, Amy Mann. Yeah, uh, again, very, very good. And there's uh, you know a lot of good stuff across this, but for me, there's one song that ruins Hold Your Fire. I'll let you guess which one it is. Tai Shan? Yes. Brings the whole album to a sweeping, screeching halt of <laughs> um, abject pretentiousness, perhaps? Yeah. I mean, I, I have to admit that that's one of the songs that when I heard it the first time, I was like, oh, no, what is this? Like that whole intro on the keyboard there, that sort of, you know, Asian tribute that they did there. I mean, but. I used to talk with my musician friends about this, like in my band, even saying that I just don't understand why they have to write, you know, songs around every sort of, you know, bicycle adventure that Neil Peart has. I mean, yes, great. He went to China, or, you know, on bike or they visited China. Like, did you have to write a song about the mountains there? Like, come on, like, really? Like, it's just, it, it's just not catchy. I can't imagine that they actually thought that their fan base would have found this like appealing because to me, what I found most uh, the biggest crime of that is that right after that song is probably one of the better songs, in my opinion, on the album high water. I really love that. The drum beginning at the beginning, that do, 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 do. It's so it reminds me of such mid eighties King Crimson, almost like something that Bill Bruford would have done on drums you know, and added in with the Simmons stuff as well in there. I mean, there's very much a sort of um, British influence on those records. Like I, you can tell they were, they loved, you know, the police, they loved King Crimson, they loved Ultravox, they loved all those kinds of bands at that time. And it started to seep over into their music like that. I mean, listen to like mystic rhythms that to me is something that could have been on a robert fripp solo record that whole thing i mean i know you may not like it but i mean i can totally hear that whole thing because like he was into that whole ovation guitar thing at one bit when he did that league of gentlemen bits with the guitars there when they had like a group of 15 students 
all playing ovation guitars and doing these really odd songs about mystic rhythms sounds like it could have came out of one of his songwriting sessions there but um it's i i just find it very interesting that uh they put those kinds of songs in like why they had something like that in there it just seems like it totally threw off the flow of that record yeah i have big bigger problems with uh moving pictures than i do or not moving pictures what is it uh which one is it well, actually on the power windows god talking about <clears throat> brain farting and mystic rhythms i despise <clears throat> with a passion it's right up there with uh taishan as really rush songs i really can say that i find it impossible to find a redeeming quality about either but i also found you know power windows used to make me really angry because back at that age i was buying kerrangs and mm -hmm. circus magazine and hit paraders and they're plastered with wasp ads and pictures and Dawkin and Motley Crue, and then you see that ad for Power Windows, and you're like, what the hell is that doing in here? That's not Motley Crue. That's not heavy metal. How dare they? Um, and obviously, yeah. Rush is Rush, and Rush can rock it as hard as just about any of those bands. Just go and put on Caress of Steel um, mm -hmm. or Fly By Night. Nice. Well, yeah, well, yeah. You know, my, my guilty pleasure being Caress of Steel, this one, I can just <clears> play any time and just dig the heck out of it every single mm -hmm. time. But, you know, mid 80s, Rush was in a weird place where, again, they had an overabundance of percussive effects. Like they bought a keyboard with a sample ROM on it that just, <clears> we're going to use every single one of these before we're done. Okay, the kitchen <laughs> sink mentality, which really seems to get in the way of Neil's lyrics. It's like they don't need little tinker bells or little mm. fairy lights in audio to bring any more attention to them because his in lyrics are intelligent enough that you really have to think about them repeatedly. And even as an adult, I'm still listening to these songs and thinking about his lyrics. And it's the gift of all time as, you know, every time I listen to a song, I walk away from it or experience something differently while listening to it either musically um the compliment to the lyrics or just thinking about the words which god how many bands do that to you yeah well it's funny that you mentioned about adding you know these little synth and tw twinkles and all these little sound effects to like get in the way of neil's lyrics um one of the great examples of this and i'm sure that people who love rush might argue with us about this that Take a song like Marathon, okay? That lyric, that line, you can do a lot in a lifetime if you don't hold out too fast. And then there's that little dee 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 dee, that the descending little keyboard line in there that happens is almost like this little bell thing that descends. And it's almost like they purposefully put that in so that not only could it like complement his lyric as they think, but they also had like a lighting effect live that did that, like a descending light thing that happened. And everybody's always like, oh, clapping when it happened, you know, because it was such a such a uh, timed event when that happened. You know, it's like, oh, here it comes. And when this part comes, you're going to look for the lights and here it comes, you know, the little lighting thing. But I, I agree that as much as I like that record, I think that they went a little overboard with the keyboards in spots. I mean, when you're hiring a guy in to the studio while you're doing the album to help you with keyboard sequencing, I mean, obviously you're going way beyond just a normal guy like even like me get pulling out my ex7 and finding stuff i mean they're going into like the minute little details of this keyboard to try to pull out every little small detail that they can from these sounds and i think that they didn't need it as much i agree with you that they didn't need it for some of these songs i mean you know songs like big money as much as there's a lot of keyboards on that as well it's not nearly as overboard as some of these other songs, you know? I mean, you listen to songs like Middletown Dreams and stuff like that. There's a lot of, like, sequence stuff where they have to play the click because it has a lot of, lot of those, you know, those kind of keyboards that go through, and you have to be on the meter with that, otherwise it just falls apart, right? I mean, there's a lot of that in there, but I grew to like that stuff. That's why when I heard Presto, and they, they were going to get away from all this stuff, they really, I think, needed to kind of beef up 
the guitars, beef up the things because you're losing a lot of sonic space when you get rid of the keyboards. I don't know if people realize how much that stuff fills up the sound. You know what I mean? That's why when they they were going live, especially for the Presto tour, I was like, Eek. like when they started playing songs like Xanadu and stuff like that, and they were using the same gear that they recorded Presto with, it sounded very weak. You know, I mean, at least when they did the Roll the Bones tour, Alex had finally got rid of some of the amps and started using Mesa Boogie power amps with the Geely and Kruger. So it kind of oomphed up the sound a little bit more live. And I think he realized that there had to be a hell of a lot more oomph, you know, on the next stuff because I've been mean, counterparts. Th that album is just my, like, I, I just can't speak enough good things about that record. I really loved it, how they went back to basics and got such a huge sound on that record. And then there, there, there they could have been in any Kerrang! magazine with no problems because that was a really hard rock record for those guys. So, you know what I mean? Like, that's counterparts was what I was waiting for whenever they were saying, Oh, it's going to be like moving pictures. Well, it's not like moving pictures, but it's very heavy sonically that way. And that's the thing I think that's missing from that Rupert Hind era stuff. You know, it's funny is, you know, the Rupert Hine era, I really love and adore. And to the point with Roll the Bones, that after that, and just living it and listening to it, I mean, I basically didn't listen to anything except that album for wow. weeks, you know, maybe even longer than that. It was just the only thing that stayed in my CD player, and I just never changed it to anything else. I was like, play wherever it was left off, it would pick back up and on we'd go. And it was so good to the point that when Counterparts came out, I didn't bother buying it. I was not interested in, I, my attitude was, well, you know what, I'm actually good right now. I don't need any new Rush music. Press play again on Roll the Bones. And mm. it's a very strange kind of attitude to have as someone who does follow bands to the point where I'm looking forward to a new album. I mean, right now we're waiting on a new album from Ace Freely to come out. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about that happening. I can't wait to hear new music, you know, even if it's Origins Volume 2, which will be a covers album. I'm very excited to hear what he does. I'm very, yeah. you know, even when Kiss was still releasing albums, I was very excited. I'm excited about a new Dawkins album. Well, an mm. old, new old Dawkins album coming out. Yeah. Um, so stuff like that has always been what has fed me. But with Rush, it got to a point in, you know, the 90s. And I'm like, eh, counterparts, I'll catch up with it at some point. And that turned into a decade mm. th that I didn't um, buy new Rush albums because I was just happy listening to what I had in their catalog already. And, and you know, you go test for Echo. I can't believe it. I didn't get that at the time. Um, and then years and years later, you know, I, I started catching up on it. I'm like, oh, bugger. You know, I should have been listening. That's some really good stuff. Counterparts, um, I find hit and miss. I So there's some stuff on it that I think is extraordinarily good. But there's kind of a similar sort of situation that we kind of both commented on with um, Presto, that mm -hmm. it's not all to that level. But mm -hmm. what I do think is an interesting thing is that that's really kind of the first album where Neil has external help with the lyrics. And mm -hmm. I, I think, thank goodness, he didn't go outside and start writing with Desmond Child. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like everyone wow. else everyone else and their dog was doing so if he, if he needs something you know where they came from with um you know between sun and moon and bringing pie du bois into the picture you know certainly help because then you you start seeing a little bit more well change to the songwriting and the lyricism that's coming through but animate Fantastic, stick it out. Fantastic, uh, mm -hmm. nobody's hero between Sun and Moon, Alien. Sure, I mean it, it's a really good album. But um, give me Test for Echo over that any day of mm -hmm. the week. Yeah, I think again, there's a beautiful example of having a blueprint of an idea, where it's like we got to get right back to basics here. Like really have, I mean, and we you got to think you know, Kevin Shirley for that, because Alex Lyson apparently was putting up quite the fight with uh, his sound during the making of that record. He was like, I want my digital delay and my reverbs on. He's like, no, you can't use this rack shit. It sounds terrible. You know, we're going back to the Marshalls and you're going into the con into the studio. You're not playing in the control room here. You're playing out there. 
It's like, I don't, and they were like, really, it was getting like apparently pretty heavy arguments with that, you know? And finally they stuck him out there and he went and did it. And he started realizing that he started enjoying, like he says, quote unquote, hearing the feedback resonating off his body when the amps are cranked in this in the studio there and you can hear it like stick it out listen to that song the guitars are just blazing on that song you know it's cut to the chase another great song you know that's, that's all kinds of guitar i mean the guitar is so prevalent on this record and and the drum sound is so back to basics again and getty's bass sound i mean they pulled out an old ancient svt ampeg bass head for that that's like that was hardly working. It was like the tubes are already busting up halfway through it in animate, but it sounds fantastic, you know. And Getty Lee was the first one to say that while he thinks it was a step in the right direction, he thinks that it was a little too raw for his likings. That album, the sound of it, and Test for Echo was that idea just polished and I'll just if the, if the distortion was on like nine on you know counterparts. They put it to like seven and a half for test for echo, but I think it was perfect. I mean, that album is, is so good. The drum sound on that is good. He went, he switched to DW drums there during that time. Uh, the bass sound is fantastic on that album. I love the guitars on that record. It's just some fantastic, and the songs are so good on that album as well. I mean, I, I can't speak enough good things. Again, counterparts was the idea. Test for Echo, I think, is the realization of that idea. Because I think from there on in, they had me hook, line, and sinker again. Like, totally in that 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 show. Like, that tour, I went to, I think, four shows on that tour. I think it was the most concerts I saw off of a one tour cycle for Rush ever. Because I thought it was so, so good. I mean, he even changed up his drum solo during that tour. Like, he did a completely new kind of drum solo during that time. Like, everything was moving again they were progressing you know what i mean and that's what rush does so well i think you know they, they went from this kind of sound to this sound to this sound to this sound. i mean think about it raw zeppelin influenced rock kind of you know showing their influences with a little bit of the progressive stuff for caress of steel in 2112 let's go a little bit more genesis yesy for Fair, farewell to kings and hemispheres then they start going, ah, oh, let's go a little bit more, you know, cut back a little bit more keyboards and stuff like that. And you know what I mean? Like you can see the development as it goes. And it's always a two album thing. They always give the idea two albums to fulfill itself and then on to another idea. Well, except for Farewell to Kings, which they ran away from because they didn't want to invade the space for cheap Blackmore would eventually take medieval <laughs> rock, um, which <laughs> I... I well, let's talk about least favorite albums in the catalog because you kind of insinuated that Presto may well be it. Would that be mm -hmm. fair or would you say there's another album in the catalog that uh, surplants it at the bottom of your kind of ordering of Kiss or Kiss of Rush studio albums? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, if you were to ask me to make a list today, tomorrow, look at a list I did like four or five months ago. Presto was always at the bottom of the list for me, for for all the reasons I talked about before. I think it was the wrong producer, too too little of this, too much of that. You know, I already went over it, what I thought of it that way, but th that's the reasoning mainly why. I mean, of the of the two album cycles, that is the one record of it I found most difficult to go through. Yeah. Okay. Mine is definitely a farewell to Kings because of side one, and uh, Cinderella, really, yeah, and Cinderella Man. I, th there's very little good on that album other than Cygnus X One, um, and Closer to the Heart. That's it. I cannot stand a farewell to Kings. It's just I, I've used the word once. It feel it almost feels wrong to use the word pretentious twice in an episode about Rush <laughs> because they're just very unpretentious, but. I find this album incredibly pretentious with its pseudo medieval stylings, <laughs> its cover, everything about it. Uh, there's also something about the sound on, mm -hmm. on the album that I, I don't find particularly pleasing. The production, mm -hmm. the overall qualities of it. I'm just trying to look quickly here at who produced it. It's Terry Brown, but. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I can it's a, it's help a very you with that. It's a very strange creature. Well, I mean, the, the, the story, and I mean, you know me, I've read every possible 
book on Rush that there was, including one of my favorites that I always refer back to all the time, you know, by, by uh, Mr. Martin Popoff. Uh, <clears throat> that album is a direct result of them finally getting success. 2112 was a windfall for them. They were allowed to go wherever they wanted to make their next record. And for a band that was so heavily influenced by, yes, Genesis, uh, all these Brit prog bands, where do you go when you have an idea to make another record? And you can go anywhere. You go to England, right? And Alex Lyson said it right out the bat, the 220 volt Marshall amps and high watt amps sound significantly different than the 110 watt or 120 watt amps that we have here in North America. I mean, Getty Lee even said to the point that the lighting looks different in England than it does here in North America, you know? Uh, and they, but they, they fully absorbed it. They wanted to have as much of that influence that British influence in their stuff. So, of course, you start pulling out the classical guitars a la Steve Hackett, you know what I mean? And you do the beginning for Farewell to Kings. You know, you, they, they get all this new gear, you know, mini moves, Taurus bass pedals. Neil gets all these blocks and chimes and stuff, and they make Xanadu, which is probably one of the best long-form songs in prog music ever, that song. I mean, uh, when you hear that low E start, and you hear those wind chimes when when Rush plays concerts, the whole place goes bananas, and all of a sudden the the cloud of marijuana starts going up when that starts. And that was one of my favorite songs to cover with any band that I was in, especially when Reckoned with one. We used to cover Xanadu all the time, and it was I don't know for me. I I've always loved that song, but I totally get where you're coming from with their medieval kind of overload there. I mean, you know, you listen to like you know Madrigal. And you hear like songs like that. It's very, very like you know, you, you're you're almost expecting to see like a you know medieval Renaissance fair around the corner, you know, after hearing that, or you expect to hear that played at a medieval Renaissance fair. Those well, songs. I, I just have images of Blackmore's <laughs> Night, you know, poncing around at the medieval ye only medieval fair. With, yeah, exactly. I, and I, I, I just can't listen to. I'm going to play it later, just for for kicks, because uh, you know you've, you've you've made some comments that means that I now have to listen to it again, which I wouldn't otherwise do. But oh my god, I, I just see Richie Blackmore, that stupid little green feather hat, and da, 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 da. I'm like you're Richie Blackmore. I mean, come on. I guess well, if it makes him happy, whatever. But you know, going back to to, to Rush, the least favorite, definitely. Um, Favorite? Is it possible for you to pick a favorite Rush album? I mean, at some point we're going to have to do a deep dive into one of these albums. For me, it's easy. Hemispheres, without a doubt. But I've also, you know, mentioned my my guilty pleasure of Caress of Steel. What is your favorite today album by Rush, and what is would you call a guilty pleasure? Um, my favorite Rush album has always been Fly by Night. It's always been that album. I mean. As far as an album that when I put it on, I can hear and feel the excitement. I can already get some of those things that I love about Rush early on there. Like By Torn the Snow Dog, I get my prog fix there, right? The, 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 and the, 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 the rocking guitar solo that Alex used. And the one thing that I was always sad about from that album on is that he never used the Cry Baby Wah as much as he did on that record. And and I love when he pulls that thing out, you know, best I can and songs like that. He was using the wah pedal a lot in that, even in Anthem, you know, he used it in parts, you know, and his soloing to me was just on a, a fantastic upper level. And I mean, I attribute it all mainly to Neil Peart because when they got him in the band, they were like, you know, they were like on fire. They're like, wow, everything that we imagined that we could do as a band, we can do with this guy now on drums, you know? And it just shows, I mean, look at, you know, Beneath Between and Behind, you know, uh, Fly By Night. In the end, I mean, the, the, like the only down song on this album to me is Rivendell. I mean, as much as I like Lord of the Rings, I mean, that song is kind of like, you know, I'm kind of nodding off when that song comes on, right? But I mean, you know, the, before, you know, there's everything that's in there, you know, making memories even is like 
decent and i mean that's a really basic song but that even has like that kind of you know push and rock into it because i mean when you hear about how that was made in the back of a station wagon when you know alex just had an acoustic guitar and he pretty much wrote it on the spot in the car you can understand that feel of it then right so but that's my favorite album i would say my guilty pleasure album I guess because, you know, by by theory, when you say guilty pleasure, is something that people wouldn't expect maybe for you to say. I, I guess I would have to say Hold Your Fire because Hold Your Fire to me is a record that nobody ever believes when I say I love that record, that I love it as much as I do. I mean, I think lyrically, Neil Peart was never better than he was on those records. Like the lyrics that he wrote on those records were so well written. I mean, I remember reading an article in the Globe and Mail here saying that those lyrics from that time period were used in, you know, university English courses that they were looked at as that good of, of, of writing. So, and I, and I, be, I believe it because it's really good open secrets, prime mover, you know, I mean, one of the, my favorite lines that he ever wrote was that the point of the journey is not to arrive. I mean, that line right there is one of the things that always kind of stuck in the back of my head when he wrote that, you know? So that to me are my two favorites. I mean, what's your guilty pleasure? Impressive steel by a mile. I mean, it gets such a bad rap um, for being, you know, the wrong album to deliver, you know, at the wrong time. Um, but they were experimenting. They were trying to stretch. There's a great. Um, it's the production that I love. I love the sound of the guitars. Uh, Bastille Day. I yeah. mean, you could tell that they'd been on the road with bands like Kiss. You could tell that they'd been on the road with bands like Aerosmith. You know, mm -hmm. they they got loud and they were. But they also the Necromancer. I mean, that's a yes. kitchen. That's a kitchen sink song, and you get into part of that uh, of under the shadow, and there's just like some guitar work that just blows my mind every time I hear it, and it, it it's just pure. It's heavy metal, um, mm -hmm. which is you know kind of mind blowing that people often think, well, Rush, you know, they're not a heavy metal band. Oh yes, they were, and boy, were they players as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, the whole second side, I mean, yeah, is it a, as good as, um, you know, the progressive kind of concept albums that would be done by them and others later? No, but it's very endearing and it does try and tell a story. And it is, I like it as much as the first Rush album, which again is very, mm -hmm. you know, kind of prototypical Zeppelin-esque music without much of an identity, which you then go into Fly By Night and you could say, well, yeah, this is a band that needed a real lyricist. Well, now you have a band with a lot of ideas, maybe too many ideas, and they're not able to fully uh, communicate them or edit them, but they're sure coming out with some pretty good duds on that album. <laughs> is, is my way of looking at it. So I love listening to it. And again, like I mentioned with some of the other things, there's always new elements that I focus in on. Every new listening experience is a new listening experience. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I love Caress of Steel. I mean, to me, I've never understood why it didn't do better, that record. I mean, the, the fact that it was their Down the Tubes tour and stuff like that, I just it, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean... You know, uh, By Turn the Snow Dog was a long song that had prog elements to it that told a story, and people loved that song. To this day, they, they pull that out in concert, people were loving it. What's the difference between that and, you know, Fountain of Lambneth? I mean, the fact is, okay, it's longer, and there's more parts to it, and it flows, and there's like a, you know, but I mean, it's a story. It told a story. I thought it told a story well, I thought. You know, yeah, okay, sure. Getty Lee's the first one to admit that they maybe smoked a little bit too much pot in the studio when they did this record. But I think that it's, again, I think endearing, like the, the, the term used is a fantastic term to use in it because I listen to it back now and it reminds me of my younger days, you know, and when I was getting into Rush and, you know, getting into music in general. And those are the kind of songs that I, I loved listening to, you know. At Lakeside Park, I mean, that's that's a place that's not far from where I am. You know, it's in St. Catharines, you know, so it's it's a it's a record that sticks here to me because I, I love it. And again, the guitar sounds in there are really raw, really in your face. And it shows Alex Lifeson and Getty Lee at some of their finest 
playing. I mean, listen to Getty's bass playing on some of those songs. It's unbelievable on that record. And Neil has one of those really punchy, dry drum sounds. I've always loved the drum sound on those records, Fly By Night, Crest of Steel. And even 2112, he has a very, you know, sounds like he was in a very small, enclosed drum room. And he has that really punchy, in-your-face, no verb at all, like dry-as-hell drums. But I, I loved the sound of his drums then. I mean, that's one thing that definitely got a little bit wetter and not as powerful on Farewell to Kings, that's for damn sure. Yeah, I, I think some of it's a bit of the contrarian in me, that I love the band's albums that didn't do so well for the bands, like Kiss's Elder, like Aerosmith, Dunn with Mirrors, like Van Halen's Diver Down. You know, I, I'm fans of the underdogs and maybe i just mm -hmm. give them a little bit more time to find something in them to appreciate that others have discarded far too easily in my view so well that's a little bit of a rush chat today you know just uh, mm -hmm. an overview focusing in on that that comment that mark did as a, a gateway into talking about presto and some of the things that we like about rush you know who knows down the road maybe we'll uh get into Rush in a little bit more depth, but I don't think I have the musical vocabulary to really do so. So it's more, it's much easier for me to say, this song good, this song not so good. <laughs> or no, that with the album, that's, that's on my level. So let's leave that there for this episode and uh, we'll call it a day. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, for Mark and myself, thanks for joining us for a little chat about Rush. Um, go and play your favorite album. And if you do comment on our episodes wherever you do so tell us what you think about what we've discussed today uh, as we'd love to hear your thoughts as well about your guilty pleasures in the rush catalog the albums that you love and maybe the ones that you don't so much all right that's it for now take care thank you for watching or listening to this episode be sure to subscribe to us like us or even leave us a review you can find us and join the conversation on facebook